pick up where we left off with uh, our discussion of tourism and tourism history in the Ozarks, and we're to our floating and fishing. Of course, the Ozarks, being uh, primarily a rural place, still attracts thousands of people year after year to fish and float and hunt and, and all that kind of stuff. And this has been going on again since the, since the late 19th century. Uh, you could say it's been going on a lot longer than that. A lot of the settlers were attracted to the Ozarks because of the wildlife and, and the, uh, they were trappers and hunters and stuff like that. But as far as sports, uh, fishing and hunting and all that kind of stuff, it's been going on since the late 1800s. It uh, has been a popular destination. Some of the earliest uh, efforts at hunting tourism or fishing tourism, that kind of stuff, were promoted by the railroads, by uh, mining companies or lumber companies. Uh, they would often have uh, kind of worked over land, cut over land. Uh, the railroads would have uh, land in remote places and would promote it uh, for, for hunting or fishing and, and that kind of stuff. Sometimes they'd promote it for agriculture. Uh, it didn't always mean that they were promoting in very good faith. Uh, sometimes they were just trying to sell land or get people to come and uh, to come to a resort or something. In some cases, uh, businessmen from St. Louis would get together and build a uh, like a, a clubhouse or a, you know a hunting lodge or what? A man cave. A man cave. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> Uh, if they were using that, that, maybe they did call them man caves back in those days. I'm not sure. They would, uh, but build places and and uh, you know a hunting lodge or a, a, a place on a river somewhere, and would you know get away for a week or two, a year, and fish and hunt and all this kind of stuff. This was ramped into a higher gear in the early 1900s. There was a very highly publicized float trip that the governor of Missouri, Herbert Hadley, and uh, some of his assistants and several other people made. There were a couple dozen people who made this float trip uh, on uh, Current River. And they had a big dinner. I think the, big, the dinner was in Salem, Missouri, before they started the trip. And it, it was, in a lot of ways, it was a publicity stunt. Hadley was the first Republican governor of Missouri since Reconstruction came to an end. And the Republicans were in part trying to build up support and kind of build a base of support for him here in the Ozarks. Uh, and the Frisco Railroad was all, also involved in this, trying to increase tourism promotion and all that kind of stuff. But he uh, took this float trip and there were reporters with him taking pictures and recounting the, the trip and all that kind of stuff and enjoyed it. And there was a pickup and, and interest in these float trips. In those days, when you talked about a float trip, they were generally for men and they were generally fishing trips. Today, if you tell someone you're going on a float, you're going to the Buffalo or the Niangua or wherever you go to, to float, the James River, usually you just hop in a canoe and you're just literally floating or paddling down a stream. In those days, a float trip signified more a fishing trip. You know, it wasn't just a group of men floating down a river. And, uh, you know, a lot of us think a float trip is just kind of wasted time if you don't have a fishing pole, you know, and you're not trying to pull something out of the river. I'm, I'm sort of a, of that mind. You know, you put me on water and I want to fish. I don't want to just sit there, you know, look around. Uh, yeah, but, uh, and that's what they were doing in those days. So a float trip was not exactly like a float trip is in the 21st century in the Ozarks. Uh, and it was always a guided float trip. And uh, several guys would pile in these big John boats, and we'll see a picture of a John boat here in a minute. Uh, and they would, uh, these were long, wooden, flat-bottomed boats, sometimes 20 feet long. And uh, they were handmade by locals in the Ozarks. And uh, the, the businessmen or whoever they were from St. Louis or Springfield or wherever they came from would usually hire a local guide uh, who would uh, theoretically take them to the best fishing holes in the river, would at the end of the day would clean the catch and, and fry up the fish and kind of take care of 
you know, just take care of everything, would be the, the guide for the, the trip. And uh, the guides often, uh, the most popular ones, as you can imagine, were the most colorful guides, the ones who told the best stories and the best jokes, and often were just kind of colorful local figures. And there were some of those who became uh, well-known, kind of legendary figures in the Ozarks, some of these guides. In the, uh, over on the current river, and I think this is a current river picture, and this is a John boat, he's sitting in a big long boat, and this is a river guide. I'm not sure what his name is, but uh, Walter Bales of Eminence, Missouri, became probably the best known of the early 19th century float guides on current river. And he ended up training several guides who worked for him, and then they went on to, to found their own uh, guide, their float fish guide services in the Eminence area. In uh, southwest Missouri and Branson, it was Jim Owen. He became sort of the father of the, the float guides on White River and the James River and in the Branson area, and he founded his own guiding service, and that's a, an advertisement for it, Jim Owen Fishing Service. So you can see there, they're talking about Ozark float trips, but it's the Jim Owen Fishing Service. And even then, this is probably from the 30s or somewhere in there. Uh, even then, when they're talking about a float trip, they're really talking about guys fishing. Were there bears back then? Uh, there would have been, by the, by the early 1900s, the bear population was severely depleted in the Ozarks. There would have been a bear or two in the most remote areas, but uh, they would have been nothing like they were 100 years or 50 years uh, before in the Ozarks. You weren't likely to encounter a bear uh, even in the most remote area in those days. You'd be much more likely to encounter a bear today than you would have been in the 19-teens or 20s or 30s. Yeah. Or the bear population is greater today. Although I have, I've never seen a bear out in the, the wild. And uh, I've always, you know, I, I want to see a bear at a good distance. You know, I don't want to stumble up on a bear cub and then have a, you know, a, a mama bear tackle me, you know, or something like that. But, uh, you know, they're, Quite a few, well, they, uh, in some places in the Ozarks, you can bear hunt today. They have, uh, bear hunting is legal. Yeah, yeah there, there are that many bears in, in some places. Yeah, black bears. Yeah, they're in, in, uh, in, in my home county down in, in Arkansas and in, in several counties in the, the White River Valley down there, there's, there's bear hunting. Yeah. <coughs> And here's a little, uh, just to remind you where these rivers and streams and stuff are we're talking about. Here's Current River. Uh, the Jack's Fork uh, goes off of Current River. It's a tributary of Current River. And, uh, of course, here's White River. It's all messed up by the lakes nowadays, but that's, the, that's where White River is. And, but you can see a lot of these uh, some of the places became better known for floating than others. White River, obviously, was well known for floating before all the dams were built. Uh, Current River. And, of course, nowadays, one of the, the leading destinations for float trips is the Buffalo River. And, of course, most people don't, don't fish on the Buffalo River. They just get in canoes or kayaks and, and float the river. Now, tourism took on different forms in the Ozarks. We've, we've already seen that there was tourism caused by the healing water craze. There was tourism because of the proximity to St. Louis and, and wealthy city people wanting to have second homes or summer cottages and stuff like that. There was tourism caused by outdoor activities in, in the Ozarks. And in some cases, there was tourism caused by the heritage of the region or the perceived heritage of the region region one of the more unique aspects of ozarks tourism here specifically in southwest missouri is the impact of a novel 
The Shepherd of the Hills by Harold Bell Wright, which was published in 1907. And it became so popular and so famous in those early days of the 20th century that the Branson area where the novel was set, the Taney County, Stone County area, the White River Valley down there, became a destination for literary tourists. I believe that's what we call them nowadays, literary tourists, people who are, you know, there are people who go to, uh, to the, the lake country in England to, uh, to read stuff, to, to go see things they've read about. And here in southwest Missouri, people were intrigued by Harold Bell Wright's novel and came because they wanted to see where all the action took place. They wanted to see if Sammy Lane was still around or young Matt and uh, all these characters uh, from, from the novel. And it really took off in the early 1900s and especially the Branson area. And this really is the, uh, the real origin of the tourist industry in Branson. So it's much older than Andy Williams or the Bald Knobbers or the Presleys, or, or any of that kind of stuff, or Silver Dollar City. It goes all the way back to the early 1900s. And even before that, there had been a, a small tourism, very small tourism industry based on cave exploration and things like that, where uh, a Marvel Cave is underneath uh, Silver Dollar City today. That had been opened for tours uh, in the late 1800s. But... But the Branson area really takes off in 19, or after 1907, after the publication of this book. It just so happens, going back to Butch's earlier point, that the railroad was in Branson by this time. It had just come through a couple years earlier before the book was published. And so people had an easy way to get to the Branson area, ride the rails and then get off and rent, uh, you know, pay one of the ta many taxi drivers who were around who would take you on the tours to show you where the Sammy Lane house was and all this kind of stuff. Most of it was just completely made up, you know, they, you know because these were fictional characters. Uh, but, and then Branson takes off even more in 1913 when uh, a power site dam was completed forming Lake Taney Como. And so you get... Uh, you get this little resort town that springs up there uh, on the, the banks of Lake Taney Como. And Taney Como is White River backed up. This was a, a dam that was built on White River to generate hydroelectricity and also to, to generate a little tourism-related income, which it, which it did. But all of this kind of stuff impacted southwest Missouri and... And a lot, of the, a lot of it had to do with, the, again, as I mentioned, the perceived heritage of the region. How many of you have read Shepherd of the Hills? Anybody? Okay, a couple, couple people done it. And Shepherd of the Hills presents, you know, it presents the Ozarks as kind of God's country, this place to, to go back to, you know, to find your your health and your spiritual health in this place. People were drawn to it by that. They were all also drawn to it by the colorful depiction of characters in there. These Ozarks characters, there were hillbilly characters, there were more kind of noble characters in there. You got a wide range of, of Ozarks kinds of characters. And these things attracted people too. They wanted to see people like this. See people like, you know, they were convinced people like uh, like these hillbillies and noble mountaineers actually existed. And they must be down there around where all the action took place. So this draws people to the Branson area. Another thing that happens in the early 20th century, not necessarily related to the growth of tourism in the Branson area because of the because of the book and because of the lake that was built there, is the early 20th century saw the creation of several resorts that were not spring water resorts in the Ozarks. These were more modern, or kind of modern 20th century style resorts. Uh, some of them tried to tap into the new automobile market, bringing in people now that, that cars were becoming more, 
popular. And we'll just briefly mention three of them in the Ozarks. Uh, two of them in northwest Arkansas, Montanay and Bella Vista. And then one down in southwest Missouri, Rockaway Beach, uh, which was on uh, Lake Taney Como. Montanay was founded by the guy pictured there, uh, Coin Harvey was his nickname. And this was uh, founded right after the turn of the century near the town of Rogers, Arkansas, and a large resort. If you, when I get this up on, on Blackboard, this will take you to a, kind of a, an online museum exhibit based on the history of, of Montanay. It's pretty neat uh, to see. And uh, it boomed for a while before World War I. Uh, people, the, the railroad would bring people close to the resort area to where the hotels were, and he actually had these uh, kind of Italian-style, Venetian-style gondolas built to row people across this body of water and, and take them to the, to the hotels. And there was Arkansas Row and Missouri Row and Oklahoma Row for you know, where people came from and, and all that stuff. Uh, but it eventually uh, went bust uh, after World War I, and today what's left of Montanay is mostly under Beaver Lake, one of the many lakes that was built in the Ozarks in the, in the 20th century. But you can see a lot more of that here, a couple pictures of Montanay. You can see pretty fancy accommodations that's, uh, you can see Oklahoma Row, and here's Missouri Row, uh, people out lounging around. Again, these were, these were wealthy people. Again, this is the early 1900s when, in an age when still your average Joe didn't vacation, didn't go on tourist trips. It was your upper crust and, and your kind of upper middle class. Uh, Montanay especially catered to the, uh, to new money people who were in the oil business. You had an explosion in the petroleum industry in the early 1900s after Spindletop and all that kind of stuff. Oklahoma certainly had all kinds of oil money. Texas, South Arkansas. And they especially uh, advertised to these people and tried to get this oil money coming in. Here's, the, uh, here's one of their boats. And... You can see that's getting into the automobile age up there. That's a neat picture. I think it was last summer when the, the lakes got so low and it got so dry. Uh, yeah, the, there's, a, there's an amphitheater area there, uh, and, and I think more of it was visible than, than usual. And he also built uh, later, sort of after the, the resort was already declining, uh, he had built some kind of, uh, uh, kind of like a pyramid or uh, some sort of monument. Uh, and I think more of it was visible than usual last summer. But the actual, the buildings and all that kind of stuff, th those are all gone. And it had gone out of business years before the, the lake was built in the 1960s anyhow. Uh, Bella Vista is still there. It's called Bella Vista Village now, just south of the Missouri state line. And it was founded uh, around the time of World War I, again, as a resort community. And uh, it was founded by two brothers from Texas. And their goal, again, was kind of like building off the idea of Coin Harvey, trying to attract... Uh, upper middle class, wealthier people from the area uh, to come to this resort area in northwest Arkansas. And they, uh, they built a small town and had lots and kind of bungalows and cottages and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Bella Vista uh, was a resort community. Nowadays, it's a retirement community. And it, it, store, it started... Uh, making the transformation from resort to com community to retirement community after World War II, especially in the 1960s. And today it's one of the biggest retirement communities in the country, I guess. Certainly 
Uh, it's, it's the biggest one that I know of in the Ozarks, uh, population-wise. Uh, but they had uh, one of their uh, chief attractions was this place they called Wonderland Cave, which was uh, literally a, a dance hall in a cave. It wasn't the only one of its kind in the Ozarks. There were several of these, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's actually the Arkansas State Legislature having a special kind of promotional meeting at, at this Wonderland Cave. I guess you can. I've never been to it. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I guess you can still go there. And then Rockaway Beach was built on Lake Taney Como just a few years after the lake was built. And Rockaway Beach advertised itself as the first family resort community west of the Mississippi. So, so that whole family idea in the Branson area has been around for a long time. Uh, and I don't know if it was or not, but pe you know, people advertise themselves however they want to, and no one necessarily calls them on it. There are questions to just how much of a family resort it was, because Rockaway Beach also claims to have been uh, the hangout of Al Capone. But Again, there are lots of places that claim to have been the hangout of Al Capone, and I don't know that he was there. He probably was. Ooh, what better place to fight? Yeah. Uh, he, he did uh, spend time at Hot Springs, uh, but that was not a family resort town. Hot Springs was a, a rollicking, sort of wild uh, little Vegas uh, back in those days before there, there was much of a Vegas. And, and uh, but so he probably spent some time in, in Rockaway Beach on the way down to Hot Springs, you know, leaves his family in Rockaway and he goes, goes down to. All right, let's see. OK, so we'll get into post-World War II era tourism. And really the two main things to keep in mind about post-World War II tourism are uh, the damming of rivers in lots of places, the creation of all these man-made reservoirs that we have in the Ozarks today. And, uh, and I'm, a lot of people probably don't even realize that, that some of these are man-made. You know, they're just lakes and they've all, they seem like they've always been around and there they are. You know, we're not Minnesota. Uh, we're not the land of lakes. We're, you know, we didn't really have lakes before we decided to start building them by damming up various streams. And then the other thing that we'll talk about is the growth of heritage tourism. Tourism that, that uh, plays up the, uh, the image of the Ozarks or the history of the Ozarks, and we'll look at various kinds of things that have resulted from heritage tourism. And some of those have been big and successful. Some of them have been flops. And we do know uh, that by the, by the late 20th century and the early 21st century, tourism is, uh, is the economy in some places. It's the industry. Let's look at the 100-year process, that, or less than 100-year process, more like about a 60-year process that helped turn the Ozarks into a land of man-made lakes that it's become today. You've got, uh, we've just talked about the first of these man-made lakes, Lake Taney Como, which will be dwarfed by the ones that come behind it. A lot of people don't even realize the Lake Taney Como is still there. It's not uh, all that impressive when we built all these big dams and much bigger lakes since then, but that was the first one to get things kicked off. And the two things that were important about Lake Taney Como are two things that become important about the other lakes, most of which the Army Corps of Engineers will build and, build, and that is the generation of hydroelectricity. That was always a big thing. And uh, the generation of tourism-related income. That comes with almost all of these as well. The First really, really big project, and 
The last one before the Army Corps of Engineers gets in on the game is the building of uh, Bagnell Dam and the Lake of the Ozarks up in the northern part of the Ozarks on the Os by damming up the Osage River. It was completed in 1931. The construction process started about 1929. And this was a massive dam building project for the, for the day and time and uh, required displacing uh, entire towns, uh, buying farmland from people, moving, moving them out of the floodplain and all that kind of stuff out of the uh, place, that, the, out of the area that would be inundated by the dam. It was built, it was a privately built, owned and operated dam by the Union Electric Light and Power Company in St. Louis. So as the name would suggest, a big part of the, the motivation for building this was to generate hydroelectricity. And it, a big part of it as well was to generate things like land sales because those of you who've been to the Lake of the Ozarks, how does the, how does the, the scenery around the Lake of the Ozarks differ from, say, uh, like, uh, you know, Truman Lake or Bull Shoals Lake? Right, you, got, you, got, you can build houses right down to the water at these places. There's, there's no, you know, there's no, no zone like you get on the Army Corps of Engineers lakes. Uh, there's, a, there's a zone that you can't build in and you have to be so far from the shore and, and all that kind of stuff. The Lake of the Ozarks, because it was privately owned and operated, uh, they started selling that land. It was high, high dollar land and allowing development to take place. And they're, you know, they've been running into different sorts of environmental problems and all that kind of stuff for years because of that. And just last year, different kinds of uh, land claim, legal problems and stuff where people had built houses on lots that they shouldn't have and, and all that kind of stuff. There's always issues going on up there, seems like. Uh, but that's one of the, that's, that's why it has a, a lot different feel. It's a privately, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. So it, it's a different kind of lake, different atmosphere, maybe contributes to our discussion earlier that it's considered danger, more dangerous than these other places. That may be why. You know, you don't have uh, the government in there, you know, putting regulations on, on this and that. And it is kind of, you do have more of a wide open atmosphere, you know, and anything goes sort of atmosphere around that place. And it's been developing for a long time, over 80 years now up there. But one of the first things that the Union Electric Light and Power Company did was set up a uh, company basically a promotional company and a real estate company to sell land, to, uh, to start setting up resorts, hotels, restaurants, all that kind of stuff around the lake uh, to take advantage of the tourists who started coming in. And even during the Depression, they started coming in. But as you can imagine, after World War II, when America embarks on this, this long period of relative prosperity and affluence when even factory workers all of a sudden have the leisure time and the money to take vacations, then the Lake of the Ozarks just explodes in popularity after World War II. And if you remember when we talked about stereotypes and I showed you those, those pictures from the New York Times that had uh, water skiers on the Lake of the Ozarks and stuff like that, uh, it just it became very popular in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and was known all around the mid-America region. People, people came to the Lake of the Ozarks from, from all over the place. As more and more lakes start to be built, then obviously it takes some of the clientele away from the Lake of the Ozarks, though the fact that the Lake of the Ozarks was not built by the Army Corps of Engineers sometimes makes it more accessible uh, for people, or at least, you know, more wide open as we were talking about. 
Here's a picture of the dam under construction in the late 20s or early 30s. There is, if you ever just look on the internet, there's no shortage of, of dam construction photographs. People like to take pictures of dams as they're being built for some reason, and you can just find them all over, all over the internet. Uh, and this is just one of many that you can find. And uh, they are kind of neat, though. We just sort of see the guts of a, of a massive project like that. As it, as it comes together. You can see the eight, it looks like a uh, horses or ox drawn something up there. I mean, we're talking about, again, over 80 years ago, so it's a mixture of more modern technology and, and some archaic methods as well. And here's a postcard with the completed Bagnell Dam and the Lake of the Ozarks behind it. And I think you can still tour Bagnell Dam. Has anybody ever toured it? Like the inside of it? You know, after 9-11, all of the Army Corps of Engineers dams stopped their tours for about 10 years or so. They just started a couple years ago giving limited tours down at Table Rock again. and. Uh, and I don't think, and I think there are still some of the Army Corps dams that, that still to this day don't do tours because of terrorism scares and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think Bagnell still does, still does tours, you know. But I went on the Table Rock tour a couple of summers ago, and it's pretty neat. You know, if you like, if you like seeing giant turbines and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting to me, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I would, I would recommend it. Well, let's see how, the, how we get all of these Army Corps of Engineers lakes that, that dot the Ozarks today. Uh, a lot of these stem from a, uh, a Depression-era congressional act called the Comprehensive Flood Control Act, and this set in motion a series of surveys and plans, and only a small percentage of the dams that the Army Corps of Engineers planned and surveyed out were ever built. You know, there are several of them that were built, but they had many, many more on the docket uh, that uh, just never got built for one reason or another because they were considered too expensive, or as you crept more into the, the latter part of the 20th century, there were environmental issues, the whole idea of damming up these free-flowing streams started to lose, uh, lose appeal for a lot of people. And uh, you get into the, you know, the, the uh, conservation and preservation movements spring up, environmental movement. But many of them were built, and had it not been for World War II, getting in the way in those early years after the act was passed, probably they would have been built long before they were, some of them. But as it, as it was, we'll look at them by uh, the river valley or by the watershed, and we'll start with the White River watershed. And the first one built, this was not the first of the Army Corps dams built in the Ozarks. Uh, we'll get to that one in a minute. But the first of the White River watershed Army Corps dams built was uh, the one that was Norfolk Dam, if, that formed Lake Norfolk. The dam is in North Arkansas. Uh, the lake extends all the way up into the southern part of Missouri, into Ozark County, Missouri. And uh, it's obviously the North Fork of the White River that was, that was dammed. And uh, that one was, uh, the, the preparation and the planning for that all started before the war started. And they already had it going, so they went ahead and finished that one, but they didn't do any more dam building projects in the Ozarks until after the war had ended. And a lot of that was just a manpower issue. So many of the, the young men who, who normally would have been working on the, the dam projects were in service and were gone. But uh, so Lake Norfolk was completed in 44. Clearwater Lake on the Black River over in southeast Missouri was completed 
in uh, 48. And then you had uh, Bull Shoals in 51. That was, uh, that was a big one, bigger than the first two. Table Rock in 58, that's the one down in southwest Missouri on White River. Greer's Ferry on the Little Red in 63. And then the last one in the White River Valley, Beaver Dam in northwest Arkansas in 66. So lots of dam building. Three of them on the, the main channel of the White River. Here's a, if you go to the, that website, if it's still up, I think it's, it's still active. Uh, there's lots of dam building pictures on that one as well. And in this case, it's the Bull Shoals Dam. And today, if you visit Bull Shoals Dam, there's actually a big visitor center up there on that hill. It's not pictured there. This is an older picture, but it's a pretty nice visitor center up there. In the Osage Basin or the Osage Watershed, now how would you pronounce that one? Palm de Terre. It looks like Palm de Terre, doesn't it? Is anybody from that area? Anybody visit the lake? Okay, Palm de Tar, that's, that's one you hear. And some of the, some of the old timers, the, the real locals in the area, uh, pronounced it uh, Pumley Tar. You know, in the Ozarks, we don't, we don't really pay attention to spelling. It's just, whatever, however the mood suits us, we'll, we'll say it. And, and that was, uh, we had a, I had an elderly gentleman in class, uh, in this class last spring, and he said that it was always uh, pumly tar when, uh, you know, for him. And, but, but you hear uh, palm de tar or, you know, I'd always said palm de tar, but I'm an outsider. You know, I didn't know. I've, I've never been on the lake before. So you got uh, the pumly tar or the palm de tar or the palm de whatever you, you want to call that. Again, it's all, it's just whatever you want to do. We're, we're about... Letting people do what they want to do in the Ozarks. That's why people like to settle here. You know, we'll leave you alone. If you want to mispronounce stuff, go ahead and do it. Uh, this one, the Stockton Lake was formed. You can see these are uh, mostly later, uh, the 60s and into the 70s. Stockton Lake on the Sauk River. And, and then you get the last one, the last of the the major Army Corps of Engineers dam building projects to be completed in the Ozarks. Uh, the uh, K. Singer Bluff Dam, which was later named Truman Lake on the Osage River. The, the first two, uh, the Palm de Tar and the Sauk, are tributaries of the Osage. And these are all in sort of the northwestern corner of the Ozarks. Uh, well, you, you never say never uh, in this kind of stuff, but I would say there, there are no immediate, as far as I know, there are no immediate plans to resurrect any of these, these dam building projects. The Army Corps of Engineers still probably has a, a warehouse of filing cases full of plans for dams. I know they had, there were all kinds of dams planned, even for small streams, you know, little tributaries and stuff that were never built for one reason or another. So they're still out there. And as far as I know, there's no one has ever come along and said, burn all the blueprints. We're never going to do these. They're just, they've just been sort of tabled indefinitely as far, as far as I know. Did I read that they're actually taking down some dams on the Colorado River? They may be. Uh, uh, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me. At some point, you got to do something. They're... You know, you've either got to do some major repairs on them or spruce them up or, or take them down or let them crumble or something. You know, we're, you know, we're not here very long. If we live, you know, 90 years, we think we've, we've accomplished something around here. And you can imagine, you know, two, three hundred years from now, I don't, I don't know if any of these dams are still going to be up. What we may decide... You know, we, we may all go back to nature and want free-flowing streams again. So I, I, I don't know. You know, it's, our, our horizons are limited 
by our own mortality, and we, can't, we don't often think beyond our own lives, you know, never, much less 500, 1,000 years down the road, but at some point, the dams are not going to be here. I just don't know when it is, you know, and I probably won't be around to see it. Fellows Lake, the the local lake here, yeah, yeah it's it's a it's a dam, but uh, yeah, pretty much any in the Ozarks anywhere that anything's called a lake, or a big pond, you know, it's it's been dammed uh, in some way. Yeah, it's just uh, I didn't include any of the more kind of municipal lakes like that, you know, the smaller sorts of things on here, and uh, but yeah, that's. There are several of those too, you know, kind of your local lakes. But, uh, but this one, Truman Lake was, the, I, I think this was, as far as I know, this was the last of the Army Corps lakes to be built in the Ozarks and nothing's been built uh, since that point. I do know that, uh, Millie, going back to your question about are they done or, or is there a possibility for others, it's been within the last 10 years when I was still teaching down at in Arkansas, there was a there was a movement by some local people. Uh, there's a uh, the river that I grew up close to is really just a big creek uh, close to my family's farm, but it's called Strawberry River. It's a tributary of the Black River, and uh, there was a movement afoot to to bring the 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 shelved dam project for the Strawberry River back out and activate it and get the dam built again. This was in the early 2000s. And immediately there, was a, there uh, was a group of people who came out and protested and said, we don't want the dam and, you know, what's, what's the use, what, that kind of stuff. And something happened and it just kind of disappeared, the talk of it disappeared. But uh, as far as I know, none of these things have ever got the complete and final acts. So should, you know, should things change at some point? I guess they could they could bring them back out on the table, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. The first of the Army Corps dams was this one, uh, constructed at Wapapello Lake on the St. Francis River over in southeast Missouri, and it is still there today. I was just there last summer, as a matter of fact. And toured the uh, their their gatehouse that they've got there, and I don't think that one was a was an electricity generating dam, uh, but it's a small small lake small dam, but it was completed just before World War II, as you can see. And now the trend over the last fifty years, you could say has been, for the most part, to move away from dam building. And this is, not, this is not only true of the Ozarks, but around the country, to move away from dam building and hydroelectricity and that kind of stuff and move more back toward free-flowing streams. Not to the point of taking dams apart and taking them down, but just not building them. And the first sign of that in the Ozarks uh, takes place in 64 when Congress establishes the Ozark National Scenic Riverways to protect uh, Current River, to preserve Current River in its free-flowing state, and Jack's Fork, uh, the primary tributary of Current River. And that's why floating is the big thing we mentioned over in the Eminence area, Shannon County, floating the Current River in the Jack's Fork. And, uh, but that happened in 64, and that was a long process that started at least back in the 50s, there were fights, uh, local uh, struggles between some people wanted the, uh, some people didn't want the, the river bothered and didn't want anybody involved. Some people wanted a dam built uh, and other people wanted the National Forest Service to be in charge of it. And eventually the bill that gets passed places this, it, it basically takes the land up and down much of Current River in Jack's Fork and uh, places it under the control of the National Park Service, which it is still, still is today. And, 
and it, it's officially dedicated in 71. Then you get a few years later, Congress passes a bigger bill called the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that includes several rivers around the United States. One of them is in the Ozarks. The 11 Point River is included under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Again, federal protection of this river. Uh, these, these acts are, were frequently uh, very unpopular on the local level, especially with, with landowners because it restricted land use uh, by landowners. In some cases, it took land away from landowners and, and ended up, or basically the federal government ends up buying land uh, from, from these landowners to put under federal control. And then in Arkansas, in 72, Congress established or passed a law, a bill establishing the Buffalo National River, and so it is a free-flowing stream, too. And there was a long, drawn-out, about a 10-year battle over the Buffalo River, too, between people who wanted to dam the river, people who wanted to keep it free-flowing, and there were splits amongst the people who wanted to keep it free-flowing between those who said, just leave it alone and don't anybody get involved. Others said, if, if we don't get involved, then... The Army Corps of Engineers eventually will win, so we have to do something with it, and it ends up being nationalized as well. Now, we can see in retrospect, if you, one of the things you can do is you look at tourism dollars, you look at income statistics, all that kind of stuff, uh, wealth statistics, and it is true that in most of these places where the rivers were left undammed, uh, the, the, uh, the income levels... Wealth levels pale in comparison to the places where the dams were built. And that's kind of the trade-off. You know, some, some people, that's why a lot of people in these areas fought to have the dams built on the current river or on the Buffalo River because they saw the examples of Norfolk Dam and Bull Shoals Dam and all these places, uh, the Lake of the Ozarks where you'd had this great commercial growth and all that kind of stuff, and that's what they wanted. And so it's, you know, it's not always a cut and dried issue here. There's, as with most things in life, it's a complex issue. There was a trade-off. You, you keep the rivers free-flowing. You preserve the rivers somewhat in their state. Uh, you, you know, you make the, the landowners mad by limiting their ability to do what they want with their land, sometimes by, by getting their land uh, and... You know, you don't, you don't always generate great money by these things. But we'll go back and look, too. This is, this is a modern-day map. This is the same one we saw, but here's, here's the buffalo. You can see there's still a handful of free-flowing streams in the Ozarks. Here's the 11 point, and we, we've already seen Current River. Uh, the Merrimack, there was, a, there was a big fight over attempts to dam the Merrimack back in the 1950s. And uh, so the Gasconade. So there are still several free-flowing streams in, in the Ozarks, but the, the real lifeblood of the Ozarks, White River, the, the one river that, that drained you know, half or more of the region, has been dammed over and over, and its tributaries have, have been dammed, and it's not, certainly not the same stream that it was before all these, these dams were built, starting with 100 years ago. Okay, let's talk about heritage uh, tourism a little bit. This is a, a big thing in the, in the Ozarks and has been for several years. Again, part of what draws some people to the Ozarks is this, this kind of hillbilly image of the Ozarks, of the backwoods, country, rural spirit of the Ozarks. And that's been drawing people to the Ozarks for, for a long time. And we, we can go back. One of the first examples of heritage tourism that we can go back to is in the 1930s when the folk festivals start. Of course, we have lots of festivals nowadays. And even here at Missouri State, we have a, an Ozarks, what's it called, cultural or celebration festival or something like that every, every September here on campus. And the roots of those go way back 
uh, in, in American history that go back at least to the 1920s when you had your first folk festivals in Appalachia that celebrated uh, mountain music, old-timey music that we talked about earlier in the semester, and sometimes uh, old-timey dance, you know, jig dancing and, and, and stuff like that, and uh, sometimes crafts and things. But the first folk festivals were held in the Ozarks in 1934, and let me see. The first one was held in Eureka Springs that year, and then there were other regional festivals scattered across the Ozarks. They were in Rolla and West Plains and Aurora, Missouri. And then after th those four festivals were held, they sort of gathered the best banjo pickers and the best white oak basket makers and all that kind of stuff from the four festivals in Eureka and, and Rolla and West Plains and Aurora and had like a regional festival in Springfield. And then... Later in 1934, the National Folk Festival was held in St. Louis that year. And eventually, the Depression and then World War II sort of slows down interest in the festival movement, but it, but it springs back up after the war, and you get the creation of the Ozark Folk Festival in Eureka Springs. It starts in 1948 and continues to this day. Again, mostly music with a little dance thrown in and some crafts and, and things like that. Uh, and then the Arkansas Folk Festival starts in 1963 in Mountain View, Arkansas, and it's still going on. They just had theirs last month. They always do it, I think it's the third weekend in April, something like that. And then that the Arkansas Folk Festival helps uh, create the Ozark Folk Center in Mountain View in 1973, and that is still in operation today, now 40 years later. And other examples of heritage tourism, Silver Dollar City, which opened in 1960, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, and Dog Patch USA. Does anybody remember Dog Patch? Down in Arkansas. Butch, did you say you, you, you passed by the what's left of it? No, there's still, a lot of the buildings and stuff are still there. It's been closed now for 20 years, but uh, the theme park, uh, it was kind of a hillbilly theme park. Uh, sounds, sounds great, and it was, you know. What's better than a hillbilly theme park? You know, I can't think of very many things. Uh, with, the, with the craze that America obviously has for for reality TV shows about backwood Southerners. It can only be a matter of time before we have a comeback of a hillbilly redneck theme park. So, you know, we may, we, Silver Dollar City. Well, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of grown past that. But it, in the beginning, you know, it was, it, was, it was a little bit like that. Speaking of Silver Dollar City, the background of that is the Hershen family who still own Silver Dollar City and lots of other stuff around the country, they had uh, they bought Marvel Cave, which originally was called Marble Cave, and they were running that in the 1950s. The Hershens were from Chicago, I believe, from some, somewhere up north. They'd moved down. They were running this cave, and it was a pretty popular attraction. It was, it was popular enough by the late 50s that they were having long lines of people waiting to tour this cave. The cave, the same cave that's underneath Silver Dollar City today. And they came up with this idea of building this little faux town, this little pretend late 1800s frontier town at the mouth of the cave for people to kind of mill around in to give them something to do while they were waiting to get into the cave. And that's how Silver Dollar City started. That little faux frontier town opened in 1960. There were five buildings originally, and it grew from there. And now I'm sure there are thousands of people who go to Silver Dollar City and don't even realize there's a cave underneath it because that's not what they're there for anymore. And, you know, I, so a lot of people go to the cave, but most people who go to Silver Dollar City don't ever even think about a cave and don't go to the cave. So that's how it starts in 1960, and you can see... Here's a picture of the original crew 
back in 1916. They had, of course, they had their stagecoach, and they, they did a little, uh, like, holding up a stagecoach sort of thing. They still do some of the same things that they did uh, back, you know, back 50-something years ago, carry on some of those traditions. But it, uh, it's obviously grown well beyond that. And part of the... Part of the, the spirit of this Silver Dollar City in the early days was, again, that heritage tourism idea, uh, playing up the kind of frontier heritage of the Ozarks. Now, what Silver Dollar City did was mixed kind of hillbilly mythology with the Wild West. We are talking about 1960, the heyday of the Western on television, when you know Westerns on TV in 1960 were like reality shows are in 2013. You know, every, two out of every three shows was a Western back in those days, and, and people were fascinated with Westerns and all that kind of stuff. So Silver Dollar City kind of mixed, kind of jumbled up the two, Ozark history and the history of the Wild West, and, and uh, capitalized on that. But it was a kind of a heritage thing. And today we know Silver Dollar City still has some of the elements of those earlier days with the, the people in granny dresses and the uh, the crafts people who were making stuff and you know dressed up in old timey clothing and stuff like that and then they do obviously do lots of stuff from uh, roller coasters to international festivals that have nothing to do with the early days of Silver Dollar City they're just kind of things that theme parks do and Silver Dollar City is popular enough and successful enough that we saw that it made the top ten of Missouri's most visited destinations by itself and uh, but it has uh, it's managed to hold on to, to some of its heritage tourism tradition while offering lots of other stuff that attracts people who aren't the least bit interested in people making walking canes and and homemade fiddles and, and stuff like that and then the last thing we've got Spiritual tourism in the Ozarks, and this, was, this involves, uh, you could throw, I guess, the precious, was that precious moments or precious memories? Precious moments. moments, the little figurine people over in, are they in Carthage or Joplin? Carthage. In Carthage. Uh, you could throw them in here too, but, but the, the big outfit when we talk about spiritual tourism in the last 50 years has been the growth of Eureka Springs, just one more element to the, a very strange mix of, of tourist appeals there in, in Eureka Springs. It starts almost 50 years ago when, uh, when publisher Gerald L.K. Smith, who uh, is quite a, quite, nowadays quite a notorious figure, he was uh, anti-Semitic and uh, made part of his fortune publishing these anti-Semitic publications and, and stuff like that. Well, he, can't, he bought a place in Eureka Springs and helped resurrect the fortunes of a declining town, even though many of the people in the town didn't like him, didn't like what he stood for. Uh, he built the Christ of the Ozarks in the late 60s, which is pictured there. Not a... Not a great work of art. The scale's a little bit off in some ways. Uh, but uh, this is built, and then, of course, uh, more, more popular than the Cross of the Ozarks, the Passion Play that he founds and opens in the late 60s and draws, eventually draws hundreds of thousands of people uh, to Eureka Springs and continues to this day to draw people to Eureka Springs. Isn't this when some of them shut down, like this here? Yeah. For, uh, they were shutting it down. They were in the process of shutting it down, but then they eventually they raised enough money to yeah. keep it going. Yeah. For, for, finan for financial reasons. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. But they, yeah. they kept it going. Did yeah. Did he kill anyone? No, no. I, I think he died years. I, I think he was pretty old in 64 when he, when he, uh, found Eureka Springs. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it seems like you don't hear as much about the passion plays you used to, and that may be a reflection of its declining fortunes. Maybe 
you know, there's only so many repeat customers they can draw in there, and, and I'm not sure if it's just not as popular as it once was or, or what, you know. Or the, or the rest of weird Eureka Springs scares off the clientele who would normally go to the Passion Play. I really don't know. But they've also got the Bible Museum there and sort of, you know, like a little miniature, you know, kind of, uh, oh, yeah, the Holy Land thing. But again... Eureka Springs is, you know, it's, it's the tourist town that you just can't kill. You know, it, it just re it finds ways to reinvent itself. And it, and it reinvents itself in so many different ways for different audiences. You know, the same place that attracts thousands and thousands of Christians every year is the same place having the rainbow parade and, and the bikers and, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just a... It's remarkable that, they, that they've been able to do what they do, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't, can we call it an Ozark success story? Or just, just a weird little place, weird little anomaly in the, in the middle of the Ozarks? I'm not sure. But I think that's the last. Yeah. And we are out of time. Does anyone have a question in the last minute that we have before 820? Okay.